All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we're going to read another sutta. Uh, we're still making our way through the middle-length discourses. Tonight, we're moving on to sutta number 66, the Latuki Kopam, the Latuki Kopama Sutta. The simile of the quail, the latukika. <laughs> um, so this is a pretty famous sutta. Um, it's one of those uh, particular suttas or teachings from the early canon that you, you do find around um, in that way. So yeah, it's kind of a, a, a known or noted sutta. Um, but interestingly, we're going to explore it tonight in, in kind of a different way. Um, meaning there's sort of what the sutta's about, but there's a lot of interesting things going on in the sutta. So we're going to kind of explore all of the different layers. It's a very beautiful sutta. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to get into it. A lot of beautiful ideas. Um, let's go ahead and sort of just lay out the beginning so that we know sort of what the sutta's about um, and like kind of what the what the theme is, shall we? So I'm going to dive right in again. This is Sutta 66, the simile of the quail. I'm over on page 551, if you happen to have the Wisdom Publication Edition. And we're off. <laughs> so this is the beginning of our sutta. Thus have I heard, it begins like all suttas begin. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of Anguttarapans, where there was a town, a town of theirs, named Apanya. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Apanya for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apanya and, her, and had returned from his alms round, after eating his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. When it was morning, the venerable Udayan, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into Apanya for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apanya and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to that same grove, for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then, while the venerable Udanya, or Udayan was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Udayan rose from meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Venerable Sir, well, actually, let's pause there. Udayan's about to get into the next section, and I just want to clarify the topic tonight. So Udayan, you know, there's this interesting beginning where the, the Buddha goes into the city, begs for food, comes back, and does his day's abiding, right? His sort of day's meditation. And then Udayan goes, begs for food the next day, comes back, has the day's abiding. And this sutta is actually going to be a lot about begging for food, actually. So the, the introduction here is important. But when Udayan is meditating, this thought arises, right? 
And I just want to clarify the language. So he has this thought. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? Now, the language is about dukkha, suffering, and it's dukkha dharma or dukkha dhamma. So unpleasant or suffering things, dukkha dharma. So how much dukkha dharma has the Buddha rid us of? How much sukkha dharma, blissful dharma, has the Blessed One brought us? So it's about duk being rid of dukkha and having attained sukkha, so getting rid of suffering, attaining bliss. And then also he has this thought, how many akushala dharma has the Blessed One rid us of? How many kushala dharma has the Blessed One brought us? And so that's the language of kushala and akushala dharma, wholesome things and unwholesome things. So the topic tonight is fourfold. We've got suffering things, blissful things, wholesome things and unwholesome things. And this sutta is going to be about both of those. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted you to be really, because I, I know a lot of you already know the, the actual language. So I wanted you to know what was being spoken about here. So that's what Udayan is, you know, he's just saying like, how great, how wonderful. The Buddha has has gotten rid of all this suffering for us, introduced us to all this bliss gotten us to get rid of all this unwholesome stuff and gotten us to embrace all this wholesome stuff. So that's his thought. <clears throat> and then he goes to the Buddha and he says, hey, I had this thought while I was meditating. And then Udayan goes on to say this. Venerable sir. So he's speaking to the Buddha. Formerly, we used to eat in the evening, in the morning, and during the day outside the proper time. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, abandon that daytime meal, which is outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day outside the proper time. Yet the Blessed One tells us to abandon it. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that daytime meal, which was outside the proper time. And let me just read the next paragraph. Then he says, we ate only in the evening and in the morning. But then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, please abandon the nighttime meal, which is outside the proper time. Venerable sir, I was upset and sad, thinking the Blessed One tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of the two meals. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Once, Venerable Sir, a certain man had obtained some soup during the day, and he said, Put that aside, and we will all eat it together in the evening. Nearly all dishes are prepared at night. Few are prepared by day. Out of love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned the nighttime meal, which was outside the proper time. All right, so let's pause there. So this is an interesting sutta, and if you were here last week, or if you watched last week's Dharma Doors, you'll notice the kind of uh, connective tissue to last week. 
So the connection is, is that both of these suttas, tonight's and last week's, are sort of about uh, the proper time to eat. If you were here last week, you'll remember the Buddha sort of was talking about how he eats, of course, only one meal a day, but he eats it all at once. And he was encouraging others to do it, but there was one monk who just couldn't do that. And so he left, he just left the order for a while, but he eventually saw the error of his ways and he came back. But that was last week's sutta. Tonight, Udayan, he's a, he's a good monk and he's actually sort of celebrating the Buddha. But this story is interesting because what it, what it tells us, and if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's no, uh, footnotes, he mentions this. Apparently, and we do know this from the Vinaya, I mentioned the Vinaya last week, but we know that at the very beginning, the rule regarding right livelihood or kind of right survival, the rule was about begging for food. And apparently, when Udayan first joined the monastic order, the monks were begging for food in the morning for breakfast in the afternoon for lunch, and in the evening for dinner. And if we're to understand Udayan, the best meal was dinner, the evening meal. But apparently the Buddha in stages said, hey, everybody, stop eating lunch. Eat breakfast, eat dinner, but don't eat after like noon. Don't eat a lunchtime meal. And Udayan expresses that when he heard that originally, he was not thrilled about this. He was upset. He was sad. But out of love and respect for the Buddha, and and I'm going to talk about this uh, in more depth, but and also out of shame and a fear of wrongdoing, Udayan agrees. But then the Buddha changes the rules again and says, all right, everybody, no more dinner either. Once again, Udayan was upset about this and, well, but eventually out of love and respect for the Buddha and out of shame and a fear of wrongdoing, he agrees to do it. So again, this is just Udayan recalling things that have happened regarding the Buddha. And what I kind of want you to know, or if you didn't pick up on it, what we're talking about here is kushala or akushala dharma, like wholesome things and unwholesome things. And so the idea is, is that following the Buddha's rules and only eating, well, now only eating breakfast is considered kushala dharma. That's considered wholesome dharma. And to eat outside the proper time is akushala, is unwholesome or unbeneficial dharma. So I just want you to recognize that we are discussing two of the topics that came to Udayan's mind. We're going to get to the bliss and the suffering a little bit later. But right now it's about the preparatory work. So the wholesome or unwholesome dharma. So after the Buddha says no more dinner, and Udayan recalls, Udayan recalls agreeing to that, there's one more paragraph, and it basically is Udayan explaining like why it was a good thing that the Buddha gave uh, told the monks not to beg for food in the evening, because he says, and it and it has happened, venerable one that bhikkhus wandering for alms in the thick of darkness of the night, they've walked into cesspools, <laughs> they've, they've fallen into sewers, they've walked into thornbrush, or they've walked into sleeping cows, they've met hoodlums who have already committed a crime, or those planning to do a crime, and they've been sexually enticed by women. Once, venerable sir, I went wandering for alms in the thick of darkness of the night, and a woman was washing a pot, and she saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed out in terror. Mercy me, a devil's come for me. I tried to tell her, sister, I'm no devil. I'm a bhikkhu. I'm a monk. 
waiting for alms. And she said, then it's a bhikkhu whose mother has died and whose father has died. Better bhikkhu that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for alms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of the night. Venerable sir, when I recollected that thought, how meant, when, or when I recollected that, I thought, how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? And how many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? All right, so he repeats his sort of realization about the Buddha. And again, the way that I understand what Udayan was saying there was he was basically saying like, you know, we were getting into all kinds of trouble, begging for food at night. The Buddha, out of his wisdom, said we should stop doing that. And we did, and that's a good thing. So isn't it great, the Kushala Dharma that the Buddha has taught us? So that's kind of what's going on with that. Before we move to the next section, which is going to be our, uh, we're basically going to get to the quail, the simile of the quail in a moment. But before that, I do want to talk quickly about the phrase, or it's the expression here, that even though Udayan was upset about the Buddha sort of changing the rules, in both instances, when the Buddha gets rid of lunch and when he gets rid of dinner, Udayan says, but out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, for the Buddha, and then this other phrase, out of shame and fear of wrongdoing. So that those two ideas, the first one that's being translated as shame, I wouldn't translate it as shame. But the word is hiri, H-I-R long I, hiri, and apatapra, or sorry, apatapra, or apatapra is this fear, it, it's fear of wrongdoing, but it's sort of about this sort of like, well, the second one of them, apatrapya, is about this sort of a real like not wanting to do something wrong and like really being on top of that, like really being considerate, conscientious, aware in that way. And so it's translated as like having a fear of wrongdoing, but what it is, is it's a strong desire to not break precepts. It's like, I really want to be good. So there's that. And then hiri, the first one of them that's being translated as shame, it's actually better trans. The really good translation that I like is self-respect. And what it is, is it's sort of about having, you know, this sense of self-respect. And the reason why I'm avoiding using the language of shame is because I don't think that that's actually the emotion that is being spoken about here. But what it is speaking about, though, is an awareness of if you have transgressed against the rules and a kind of personal awareness that that, that was wrong, that like, I shouldn't have done that. And, and that's where it gets translated as shame but it's not about shame. It's just about a, a kind of awareness that, oh, I messed up there. And I just want you to notice how these two, and by the way, these two ideas, hiri and apatrapya, they're always, they always kind of go together. And it's sort of about not wanting to break any rules. But if I happen to break a rule, there's a sense of kind of a, an acknowledgement of that. And again, a sense of like, I messed up. So those are the qualities that's being spoken about in terms of this shame and a, and a dread of blame or a fear of wrongdoing. I've, I've heard it translated as a dread of blame. But again, it's about 
relationship with the rules, which is what this sutra is kind of about in that way. The one thing that I want to mention before we move ahead, though, this is one of those suttas, all of it, by the way, there's little parts in here. I'm going to, I'm going to tease out, but this is one of those suttas that has a lot of little ideas that become very important ideas in the Mahayana Bodhisattva path. And so what I mean is, is that if you start studying Mahayana sutta, sutras and you start studying kind of Mahayana Dharma, you actually start to see Hiri and Apatrapya a lot because it's a really big part of the Bodhisattva path is kind of having this kind of conscientiousness and what we're going to see in a moment, what we're going to see is, is that there's a connection with last week's sutra, and I didn't really talk too much about it last week, but there's a part of, of this sutra tonight that's about, it's kind of about setting a good example in a way. And so this idea that like the reason last week when the monk was like, ah, I can't, I can't really follow those rules. So I'm just going to go over here. And the Buddha was like, you didn't think, did you, that people were going to see you in the monastic robes and they're going to see you eating at all kinds of times of the day. And you didn't, you didn't acknowledge that you were going to kind of basically be creating a bad reputation for the rest of us. So like the Buddha kind of criticizes that monk for kind of only thinking about himself in that way. So the connection with this one is that there's this, well, it's a, we're, we're going to dig deep, deeper into it, but it's this sort of adhering to Kushala Dharma, the importance of adhering to wholesome things in that way. All right. Yeah, exactly, Maria. Exactly. That's sort of, it's part of what we've signed up to do in that way so good yeah so excellent all right so in many ways all we've done so far is really set up like what the sutra is about nothing's really kind of happened yet but now in paragraph seven uh yeah paragraph seven page 553 the buddha says after Udayan once again celebrates the Buddha for bringing bliss and wholesome dharmas, the Buddha says, so too, Udayan, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They say, what, such a mere trifle? Such a little thing as this? <laughs> this recluse is way too exacting. And they do not abandon that thing. And they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. And for them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. All right, we're about to get to the quail, but I, mean, I, need to, I need to dissect a few things in there. So this is what's going on in this sutta. This is about the Buddha <laughs> giving, laying down the precepts. So this is about the Buddha saying things like, um, stop eating lunch or stop eating dinner. But my point is, is that the Buddha lays down this kind of precept or lays down a rule and says, hey, everybody, if you if you wanna be a bhikkhu, you wanna be a bhikkhuni, no more lunch. So that's the thing in this case. And, but there's some, there's some, what do they call? There's this great term for the uh, mogha parisia, a uh, a misguided person, a stupid person. But there are certain misguided people 
who, when told by me, abandoned that, like stop eating lunch. They say, ah, what, what's the deal? What, why, what's the big deal? What, such a little thing? Such a mere trifle? This, this Gotama dude is just, he's way too intense. <laughs> he's way too exacting. And they don't abandon the thing that I told them to abandon. And not only that, they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards the bhikkhus who are, act who are actually trying to follow those rules, right? Now, what the Buddha says is, is that for those people who don't abandon that thing, it becomes strong. It becomes stout. It becomes tough and unrotting tether and then ultimately a thick yoke. So tonight, as we move through this, I want us to really kind of, um, how can I put this? Yeah, I was thinking about this earlier, you know, cause I know that most of us here, I know all of us here, but I, everybody watching this in that way is probably not a renunciant is not like a monastic in that way. So you probably eat lunch, you probably eat dinner, and you haven't probably made a vow or taken precepts to not eat lunch or dinner, right? So I wanna kind of do this tonight in a way where everybody can teach themselves the Dharma, like kind of fill, fill in your own, uh, fill in your own vice kind of an idea in that way. And what I mean by that is this, it could be anything, it really could, but take for example, you know, having a drink every now and then, you know, the Buddha says we shouldn't really inebriate ourselves. We shouldn't take alcohol. That's part of the, that's one of the precepts, but somebody might think, Ah, but what's the big deal? What's the harm in just a little drink every now and then, right? Who care? Who cares about that the Buddha said stop doing it? This Gotama, he's so exacting, right? He's so <laughs> intense about these things. But what the Buddha's saying is, is that I've asked you or I've suggested that you give up that thing. And for those who don't, that thing becomes strong. <laughs> It becomes stout, it becomes tough, it becomes an unrotting tether, it becomes a thick yoke. But again, it could be anything, it could be any of these little things, or they could be big things, but I'm specifically thinking about these things that we, that in our practice, we might think, oh, what's the big deal? Like, I, I know that the tradition or the teacher or the Buddha's telling me I should avoid that, but what's the big deal? That's what this sutra is about tonight. Like that idea of, of sort of knowing that there's this precept or this rule, but then saying, eh, but this, this Buddha is too intense or he's too exacting. So that's sort of the theme tonight. But now the Buddha gets to the simile of the quail to explain a little bit more about this. So he says, suppose Udayan, a tiny little quail were tethered by a rotting creeper vine and would thereby expect injury, captivity, or even death. Now, suppose someone were to say, that rotting creeper vine by which that quail is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, and death, it is for her, it's feeble, it's weak, it's rotting, it's a coreless tether. Udayan, would they be speaking rightly? Udayan replied, no, venerable sir, for... For that little quail, the rotting creeper by which she is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death is a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether. 
and a thick yoke. So too, Udayan, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They don't abandon that thing. And they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Udayan. There are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this. They say, what, such a mere trifle? Such a little thing to be abandoned as this? The Blessed One tells us to abandon. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish. Yet they abandon that, and they do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned that thing, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. All right, we're going to do one more, and then we'll do the whole thing. But suppose, Udayan, a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full-grown in stature, high-bred, and accustomed to battle. Suppose that elephant were tethered by stout leather tongs, or was tethered by stout leather thongs, but by sw simply twisting its body a little, he could break and burst those thongs and then go wherever he likes. Now, suppose someone said, the stout leather thongs by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered, they are for him strong, stout, tough, unrotting. It's an unrotting tether, a thick yoke. What do you think, Udayan? Would they be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The stout leather thongs by which that royal tusker elephant is tethered, which by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst and then go wherever, wherever he likes. For him, they are feeble. It's weak, rotting. It's a coreless tether. So too, Udayan, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this. And they abandon that. And they don't show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desires of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as loose as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. All right, so there's a few more examples, and I do want to read them, but let's just deal with the quail and the elephant in that in those two examples. So this is actually, I think, very, very interesting from a kind of Buddhist studies point of view. It's more interesting than it might seem at first. So at first blush, this is an, an analogy, right, about, well, it's an analogy in all of this. This whole sutta, by the way, is about samyojana, and this, this is a term we talked about last week, I believe. Samyojana is the word for being tethered. Um, and actually, that word, samyojana, the root of that word is, it's kind of where we get the word yoga from. But my point is, is that it's also where we actually get the word yoke from. And you might have noticed that the sutra keeps using that word yoke. If you don't know what a yoke is, I do want to remind you 
that if you have like a ox or a, a um, uh, what's, what would be called a beast of burden, but you have like a an animal that's going to pull a cart or pull something, they put this kind of um, apparatus around its neck that ties it to the, the cart. And that's called a yoke. And it's basically what they use to pull the cart. But the idea is it's being kind of bound to something, being tethered to something in that way. And so there's this example that the Buddha gives, and it's where the suttas, the name of the sutta comes from, the simile of the quail. And it's about this tiny little quail and a little creeper vine, you know, just a little morning glory kind of vine has like grabbed this little quail. And the point is, is that for that little quail, that creeper vine is going to keep winding around it and eventually going to injure it and probably even kill it. And the Buddha says, so for that little quail being coiled up, if somebody were to say, but, but that's just a little, it's just a little creeper vine. It's just a little creeper vine. Like, what's the big deal? It's just a little vine. But what the Buddha says is, but for that quail, it's a very strong tether. It's a very stout tether, right? It's a thick yoke for that little bird. Contrast that with this mighty tusker elephant that's being kind of held down by nothing, just some like nothing kind of cords. And it, as it says, there's the cords that are holding the elephant back. They're so weak that all it would have to do is twist its body a little bit and it would break free. Now, the Buddha says, Udayan, if somebody says that the elephant is tethered with strong cords, would that be true? And Udayan says, no, that's not true at all because he could just bust right out of them. Now, of course, what's the what's being referred to here, and in many ways, I should probably even read the next one to make this like make total sense in that way. Yeah, we might want to read the next one. Yeah, and actually for time's sake too, because there's so much good stuff going on. Let me read one more of the analogies. It's still in the same vein. It's just going to give us a little more to talk about. So this is another uh, uh, simile that the Buddha gives. I'm at uh, section 11. He says, suppose, Udayan, <laughs> there was a poor, penniless, destitute man, and he had one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and he had one dilapidated wicker bed, not the best kind, and he had some grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind. And he had one hag of a wife, not the best kind. He might see a bhikkhu in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. And that penniless man might think, how pleasant the recluse's life is. How healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. But being unable to abandon his one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and his one dilapidated wicker bed, not the best kind, and his grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and his hag of a wife, <clears throat> not the best kind. He is unable to shave off his beard and hair, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now, suppose somebody said, the tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, and shave off his beard and, and hair, put on the yellow robe and go forth into home life and homelessness. If somebody were to say that for him, those bonds or those tethers are feeble, weak, 
rotting, a coreless tether. Would they be speaking rightly, Udayan? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard, <clears throat> put on a yellow robe and go forth into the home life, go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are strong, stout, tough, unrotting tethers, a thick yoke. So too, Udayan, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They don't abandon that. And they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards the bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. But suppose, Udayan, there were a rich householder or a householder's son with, a great, with great wealth and great property, with a vast number of gold ingots, a vast number of granaries, a vast number of fields, a vast amount of land, a vast amount of wives, and a vast number of men and women slaves. He too might see a bhikkhu in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. And he might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. And that rich man, being able to abandon his vast number of gold ingots, his vast number of granaries, his vast number of fields, his vast number amount of land, his vast number of wives, and his vast number of men and women slaves, and he's able to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home, home life into homelessness. Now, suppose someone said, the tethers by which that rich man or that rich householder's son are tethered so that he can abandon his vast number of gold ingots and all of his other wealth and his vast number of men and women slaves and shave off his beard and hair, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are strong, stout, tough, unrotting tethers and a thick yoke. What do you think, Udayin? Would they be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that householder or that householder's son are tethered so that they can abandon their vast number of gold ingots and their vast number of men and women slaves and shave off their hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him or for them, those are feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tethers. And so too, Udayan, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this. They abandon that, and they do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. All right. So let's put this together. So if you didn't kind of catch it, the Buddha puts up the simile of the quail and the simile of the elephant. And then this is going to correspond to the penniless man with his, you know, little hovel and the rich man or the rich uh, householder son. So those are gonna correspond. And, you know, basically this is that kind of, it's a very interesting sutra. And this is what I kind of really wanna focus on. It's a, it's an aspect of this sutra that I just 
I didn't really see anybody talking about. <clears throat> and what it is, it's an idea. And it's, again, this is an idea that you find uh, articulated in the Mahayana tradition. It's, it's, a, it's a particular idea, but it's, it's in here. And what it is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, you will hear a lot of talk about the, I guess in, in Sanskrit, it would be the sattva dhattu, the realm of sentient beings. And the realm of sentient beings is different than the realm of dharma, the dharma dhatu, the realm of phenomena or the realm of objects or the realm of things. The realm of sentient beings is this kind of idea of, well, <laughs> the realm of the realm of sentient beings. But there's a particular like understanding of that idea or a particular connotation to that idea. And it's in this sutra, or at least I see it in the sutra. And what it is, is we want to go back and we want to think about that the the simile of the quail. And what we want to think about is the, remember when the Buddha, the Buddha said, you know, there's this little quail that's being kind of captured by this little creeper vine. And the Buddha asks, if somebody were to say that that creeper vine is, it's like weak, it's nothing, would that be right? And the answer is no, because for that little quail, <laughs> that creeper is strong. And for me, this is a really important aspect of the realm of sentient beings, which is actually, I mean, you could kind of call it or think about it as like uh, relative psychological spheres. And what I mean by that is it's that for that little quail, life is different than for you and I, bigger mammal uh, beings, us human beings in that way. Like we're moving, we move at the human scale. And there's a way in which we could then look at a little creeper vine and just be like, eh, it's just, it's whatever, it's a little vine. But if you're sensitive to the plight of quail, <laughs> If you're sensitive to the lives of smaller creatures, you would be like, you know what? For me, that creeper vine is no threat, but to a little quail, it's a threat. And so a lot of this is about sort of, you know, taking our value system, our scale, and understanding it as just our scale in that way. Now, this gets contrasted with the elephant who has a different relationship with the bondage, right? Where the elephant can easily break out of it. And then those two, the quail and the elephant, are contrasted with this poor, destitute person who lives in a, a little hovel, doesn't have anything, right? But for that person, they are so attached to their little hovel and their little wicker bed and their little pot of pumpkin seeds, they're so attached to it that for them, it's a strong tether. But then the Buddha says, but let's say there's this rich person and they just whoop, give it all up easily. For them, even though it was a lot of wealth, their relationship to that wealth was that they weren't clinging to it. And they easily gave it up when the Buddha said, yo, give it up. And they gave it up. And so this is a really interesting sutra about like, you know, which is harder to give up? A, a, a little shack or a mansion? It depends. But notice how you might have said, well, a little shack's easier to give up than a mansion. But that's maybe from your perspective. 
And so this sutra is sort of challenging us to sort of think about other people's perspectives to think about other, even other animals' perspectives, if you want to read it that way. So I just wanted to say that about the simile of the quail, that you could really read into that a lot about, if you if you wanted to kind of go down more of the bodhisattva path, you could read that simile in a more interesting way. So, all right, there's a lot more to go though. Any questions about the simile of the quail? What's What's up with all of that? Feeling okay? <laughs> well, the next part's very interesting too. Oh yeah, please, Noe. I'm sorry, uh, Maria. Do you have something to say? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank Thanks, Noe. All right. Well, this next part, I think it'll. You know, if there's ideas that are lingering, this next part might help bring them to the surface. So, the Buddha says this is after the four similes. Uh, page 553, the Buddha says, uh, actually, sorry, 555, apologies, section 13, or paragraph 13, the Buddha says, Udayan, there are four kinds of pudgala, there's four kinds of persons to be found existing in the world. <laughs> what are those four? And before I tell you about those four, before we read it, I do want you to know, because I've been kind of introducing some Mahayana Buddhist ideas tonight, I do want you to know that the word that's being used here to speak of the four kinds of people or the four kinds of persons, I want you to know that that word is this word pudgala. And a pudgala is this kind of word idea that... It's actually the, it's a, a hotly debated topic in the world of Buddhism. And what it is, is it's sort of, um, it's a Buddhist idea of a type of person. So it's not like, it's not your personality exactly. A pudgala is a personality. And there's different types of personalities. And actually, in some Buddhist traditions, there's 84,000 different types of people. There's 84,000 varieties of pudgala. And you're one of those varieties. You, you would fit into one of those categories of pudgala. So I just want you to know that there's this interesting idea for personhood or personality and the Buddhists kind of use it a lot to refer to what I should tell you is, is that when you start to get into the really fancy Buddhist thinking, like really philosophical thinking about like no self, when the Buddhists want to be really careful about not reifying a self, they speak in terms of pudgalas, like personalities, but no person exactly. So this pudgala is an interesting idea. And by the way, in the Pali, the Buddha sort of just uses it as like a person, a kind of generic word for a type of person. And then in the Mahayana, it becomes a more technical term. But if you're familiar with pudgala, I want you to know that they're using that term here. But what are these four types of people, you may ask? <laughs> well, here, Udayan, some person, it could be anybody, but some person practices the way to the abandoning of acquisitions, to the relinquishing of acquisitions. And when they're practicing the way, memories, and intentions associated with their acquisitions beset them. They tolerate them, meaning they tolerate those memories and those intentions. They don't abandon them. They don't remove them. They don't do away with them. They don't annihilate them. Such a person 
I call fettered, not unfettered. And why is that? Because I've known that particular diversity of faculties in this person. All right, we're gonna spend a moment on the first kind of person just to clarify a bunch of language and then we'll do the next three kinds of people, but I want you to kind of know what's going on here. So the Buddha has put this specifically in terms of uh, renunciation. So the Buddha's putting this strictly in terms of somebody who has said, you know what? I want to shave off my hair and beard. I want to don the yellow robe. I want to go forth from the home life into homelessness. So you know what? I'm giving up and relinquishing all of my acquisitions. That's what the Buddha is talking about. But what he's talking about with this first kind of person is the person who does that. And then they start the cultivation of their practice. So they start a meditation practice. They start cultivating. And then when they're practicing the way, when they're practicing, say, meditation, memories of their stuff pop up intentions associated with their acquisitions with their stuff pops up and they don't and and they tolerate those memories and those intentions they don't abandon them they don't remove them they don't do away with them they don't annihilate them the buddha says that kind of person is tethered well again what I want to do tonight is I want to, you know, I really want this to be applicable to all of us. Be so because of where this is about to go, and it's about to go somewhere very interesting, I want us to sort of, I want us to be aware and comfortable of substituting, say, acquisitions stuff. We can substitute anything in here. And so... You know, I mentioned um, I mentioned the the precept against uh, alcohol, for example. Well, maybe you've decided to be sober. Maybe that's your renunciation is re renouncing alcohol, and so you've done it, and now you're on the way. You're practicing, and during your meditation, or just during your life, during your practice, thoughts of having a drink come up. The first kind of person here tolerates those thoughts popping up. They don't abandon them. They don't annihilate them. They don't get rid of them. The Buddha says, I call that kind of person tethered, not unfettered. Again, it could be about you've decided you have a problem with your libido. You have just too much sexual energy and you're like, you know what? I need to bring this down. I need to get this in control. You've decided to abandon that in that way. But maybe during meditation, images and thoughts come to mind. The first kind of person tolerates those, doesn't abandon them, doesn't annihilate them. The Buddha says that kind of person is fettered. So again, substitute whatever you've decided isn't working for you and you've decided to put away. But in the cultivation of your practice, it pops up. So if you tolerate it and don't get rid of it, the Buddha would then say you're fettered, not unfettered. Now, person number two. Here, Udayan. Some person practices the way to the abandoning of, let's say, acquisitions, to the relinquishing of, let's say, acquisitions. And when they're practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with the acquisitions beset them. They do not tolerate them. They abandon them. They remove them. They do away with them and annihilate them. Such a person too, I call fettered, not unfettered. And why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties of this person. Person number three, and then we'll talk about them. Here, Udayan, 
Some person practices the way to the abandoning of, let's say, acquisitions, to the relinquishing of, let's say, acquisitions. And when they're practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with their acquisitions beset them every now and then through lapses of mindfulness. Their mindfulness may be slow in arising, but they quickly abandon them, remove them, do away with them, and annihilate them. Just as, if, just as if two or three drops of water were to fall onto an iron plate heated for a whole day, the falling of the water drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too, here, some person practices the way, but their mindfulness, it might lapse, and their mindfulness might be slow in arising, but they quickly abandon those memories and intentions. They remove them, do away with them, and annihilate them. Such a person, too, I call fettered, not unfettered. And why is that? because I have known the particular diversity of faculties of this person. But number four, here Udayan, some person having understood that acquisition is the root of suffering, div divests themselves of acquisitions and is liberated through the destruction of their acquisitions. Such a person I call unfettered, not fettered. And why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties of this person. So those are the four kinds of people. Again, we want to notice that it doesn't, they're speaking about renouncing, you know, renouncing acquisitions, renouncing property in that sense. But again, I would strongly encourage you to substitute whatever <laughs> obtrusive thought it might be in that way regarding, again, what you've decided already to relinquish in that way. And the first one, the thoughts are going to pop up and there's no attempt to get rid of them. There's basically just like, ooh, yeah, <laughs> just dwelling in the thoughts as they arise, fettered. The second kind of person, they pop up, but they want to get rid of them. They're not tolerating them. They're abandoning them, annihilating them in that way. But that person's still fettered because they're popping up, even though they're working on getting rid of them in that way. The third kind of person, it's only when their mindfulness sort of lapses a little bit that every now and then a little thought pops up. And they very, very, very quickly are able to get rid of it and go right back to their meditation. But the Buddha says they're still fettered. Why? Because those thoughts still pop up every now and then. It's only the fourth kind of person that the Buddha calls unfettered. And by the way, the fourth kind of person here is traditionally an arahat. That's what it means. So I want us to understand that to be unfettered is the ultimate goal of this. So, um, and then again, this idea that for them, the thoughts don't even arise. That's what it means to be unfettered. They just, it doesn't even pop up anymore at all. And I would suggest in terms of just approaching Buddhism as a psychological tradition, this is a good description of what this is about, is that Normally, we just tolerate this stuff. We can develop a, pro a process and a practice of getting rid of those obtrusive thoughts. If we do that enough, eventually they'll stop popping up and they'll only be every now and then. And eventually you can get rid of them all together. That's the idea. So any questions about the four kinds of pudgala? Yeah, Robin, please. Oh, 
I can't hear you, Robin. We need to unmute you. I'm working on it. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> um, Noe, do you know how to unmute people? All right now. Up, oh. Robin. Can yeah. You unmute yourself now. Okay. Oh, good. There you go. Yeah, there you go. And I could I could type it in the chat too. Oh no! Please, please go ahead. I noticed that the fourth type of person understood that it was the root of all suffering. So it was like it kind of the other ones didn't really understand. They were sort of seeing things as the struggle and everything. Excellent. Very good. And that is indeed the idea of sort of knowing or understanding the Four Noble Truths and sort of recognizing these fetters as suffering in that way. And so for, yeah, for that fourth kind of person who understands the, like the four noble truths in that way, for them, it's sort of like the, the, they're looking at, let, let's just take this sutra where it's talking about acquisitions and this unfettered mind is looking at that, a piece of property as suffering, as a fetter. Like, why would I even want to get near that? And that's why the obtrusive thoughts in that sense are not popping up in their mind anymore because it's not even desirable for them anymore in that way. So nice. Thanks for pointing that one out. All right, let's keep going because I think we could actually get through it. So I want to also reinforce one idea that so far we have all, we have just been talking about Kushala Akushala Dharma, wholesome things and unwholesome things. That remember at the very beginning of the sutta, Udayan was like, oh, the Buddha, right? He's he's gotten us to get rid of so many unwholesome things and to take on so many wholesome things. Well, now in the sutta, we're going to get to that first part about dukkha dharma and sukha dharma, about the suffering and blissful things. So in, in section 18, bottom of page 556, he says there are, Udayan, these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, also desirous. Odors cognizable by the nose, also desirous. Flavors cognizable by the tongue. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, Udayan, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent upon these five chords of sensual pleasure, well, that's called sensual pleasure. It's a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated that it should actually be feared. So now we are talking about sukha and dukkha and the idea, and I mentioned this a lot, it's the idea that pleasure derived from things and independence upon things, yeah, that's not actually pleasure. It's a quote, filthy pleasure or a coarse pleasure or an ignoble pleasure. So it's not actually sukha, it's dukkha in disguise, so to speak. But now, verse 20, here Udayan, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from akushala dharmas, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, they enter upon and abide in the second jhana. 
and with the fading away as well of rapture, they enter upon and abide in the third jhana. And with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, they enter upon and abide in the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of sukha, I say of this kind of pleasure, that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, and that it should not be feared. Here, Udayan, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from Akushala dharmas, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Now this, I say, belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? It's the applied and sustained thought that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. All right, so this is getting subtle. So I want to clarify the Buddha said, yeah, yeah, if your pleasure is resting on something, is derived or dependent upon something, that's dukkha in disguise, but secluded from sensual, removed from sensual pleasures, removed from unwholesome states, you practice jhana in that way. And I want you to notice, this is so important to like understanding Buddhism, when he says, yeah, that pleasure, pursue it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't fear it. So I'm always saying the Buddha wants us to be having a much better time than we're having. And that's the idea that our our idea of pleasure is a little misguided. Pursue this kind of pleasure. Pursue sovereign independence. <laughs> That's the message. But what's really interesting as we go deeper into this is when the Buddha says, but if you're just in the first jhana, that is actually still perturbable. You are still disturbable in the first jhana. And why? Because of vitarka and vichaya, because of this sustain, applied and sustained thought. So there's still discursive thinking going on in the first jhana. There's still a sense of, this is great. I love being in the first jhana. But because there's a discursive mind, there's the opportunity for, for being perturbed. Now, here Udayan with the stilling of vitarka and vichaya, so with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana. Now this, I say, also belongs to the perturbable. And what in the second jhana could be perturbable? The rapture and the pleasure that have not ceased therein that's what belongs to the perturbable. But herein, Udayan, with the fading away of the rapture, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the third jhana. Now this, I say, also belongs to the perturbable. And what in the third jhana is perturbable? the pleasure of equanimity that has not ceased therein. That's what belongs to the perturbable. So here, Udayan, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. And now I say that that, that belongs to the imperturbable. So that's the kind of the reason to keep going in jhana practice all the way to the fourth jhana because the first three are still disturbable because they're still sort of, you, you can kind of notice it. There's still a kind of a dependence on something in that way. Even though we've removed ourselves, there's still this sort of dependence on sustained and applied thinking, a dependence upon the rapture, 
a dependence upon the kind of equanimity in that sense. But then in that fourth jhana, when we're beyond pleasure and pain, it's imperturbable in that way. So any questions about any of that before we go through the rest of the sutta? Yeah, Maria, been wait. I've been waiting. It's not super heavy. I just wondering what you have to say about how does this carry over into for how does this play out for us? Like, how does this play out in like our regular, you know, 2024 lives? How can we bring this into everyday life um, where we're not secluded? from all of these things. Um, I mean, I guess it's just a practice of um, pursuing the ultimate goal, <laughs> I guess, of, you know, a state that an arhat might be in, but that's kind of, I don't know, maybe so, so, uh, definitely sometimes it seems far away, um, definitely have some things that I work with around this where the thoughts are, you know, they're definitely popping up. I'm not encouraging them anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've gotten beyond that, um, thankfully. But yeah, so, you know, for those of us who aren't monastics, mm -hmm. what's this look like? Well, I mean, there's a, a few different things going on in the sutta at this point. Um, I think what the way that I would want to respond to that is, so let's take, let, let's go back to, let's go back to the original idea of the sutta that the Buddha is talking about. So he's talking about uh, renouncing acquisitions and like renouncing stuff, renouncing property in that way. Right. And the idea here is of course, that, you know, the, the basic idea of this, of course, is that, you know, bills and mortgages and rent and all of that is just a headache. <laughs> it's just fetters. It's just a mess. And so renounce is the original Buddhist answer to that problem. Just get, get away from it all. But like Maria is saying, we're not renunciants in that way. But the thing that I would want to say is, is this. Let's say you let's say that you recognized that the acquisition of property was sort of a problem. Like you were sort of intuitively understanding like the Dharma in that way, where you just kind of recognize like, this is all a headache. But if you sort of are in a culture that is encouraging you to own property and, and encouraging you to buy things and encouraging you that that is like happiness to have things, there's a, a, a kind of from a Buddhist perspective that it's kind of very difficult to practice in the culture of acquisition. It's very difficult to practice non-acquisition. And so it's just easier to renounce. But my point is, Maria, that it it's not necessary, though. My point is, is that there is this sort of... Um, it's just, a, it is what the Bodhisattva practice is about. And you know this, Maria, but it's about this sort of the practice of being, quote, in the world, but not of the world. And that would be the idea of like being among householders with all of their property, but yourself not participating in that in a way. Not renouncing, but also not getting involved in it either. Right. And I think that maybe um, some of this language about the root um, comes down to intention and having a clear intention um, to sort of keep heading in, in the direction of putting things down that, that of, of, at least we know our fetters or that we know are 
um, you know, holding us back. Well, on that note, Maria, you said something interesting that I'd love to kind of respond to. So the one idea that I'd like to make like super crystal clear here. So there's, there's a certain language in the world of Buddhism. It's not in the sutta, but it is what they're talking about. The language that you know, it's the language of conditioned dharma and unconditioned dharma. So conditional or relative dharma, meaning conditional or relative phenomena, and then unconditioned, unconditional, unrelative. Now, if you've studied Buddhism, you'll know that basically there is only one unconditioned dharma, and that's nirvana. But allow me to explain. That idea of nirvana is this teaching of cessation. It is the teaching of no self. In other words, it's about... Uh, the unconditioned is unconditioned. It's unconditional. It 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 doesn't have a a shape or a smell or a taste or it 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 is it is beyond all of that. That's the whole point. It's unconditional. Anything conditional is suffering. Anything, and when I say conditional, I mean take your pick. And so what what I what I mean is is that it's kind of actually interesting that from a Buddhist perspective any conditioned dharma is as dangerous as any other conditioned dharma. And the idea here is is that we the mind is sort of wrapped up in the conditional but we don't know it's conditional. This is kind of the thing that I kind of often am, am kind of keep coming back to with this idea about characteristics and that we think things actually have the characteristics that we think they have, and that's what makes them desirable. But really, those characteristics are not there. They're dependently arising in that way. And so all conditioned dharmas are like illusions and bubbles and shadows and tricks and like things seen in a dream. None of it is worth clinging to, getting wrapped up in. And what I'm getting at is, yeah, excellent. Yeah, that it's like, take your pick, it doesn't matter. And then there's the unconditioned. So, yeah. Oh, good. Any other questions before we finish up the sutra real quick? All right, so after we've reached the imperturbable state of the fourth jhana, where nothing can get to us, nothing could perturb us in that way, the Buddha goes on to say here, this is on page 558, section 26, here, Udayan, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from akushala dharmas, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana. But that, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it. And what surmounteth, surmounts it? Here, Udayan, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana. That surmounts it. So surmount it. <laughs> but that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts the second jhana? Well, here, Udayan, with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the third jhana. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udayan, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udayan, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, 
with the total disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with the non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it, I say. And what surmounts that? Here, Udayan, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there's nothing at all, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts that? Here, Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts that? Here, Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surmounts it. Thus I speak of the abandoning even of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Do you see, Udayan, any fetter, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak? No, Venerable Sir. That's what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Udayan was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Excellent. So, a little, you know, the classic meditation at the end there, but kind of in the, um, in the spirit of the sutra, of like, surmounting of keeping going in that way notice that the idea here is is that even those lower samadhis infinite space infinite consciousness are still surmountable in that way so they're, they're, they're subtle right and that's what he means by like this sort of abandoning of both like the, the gross and the subtle in that way so any questions about the end of the sutta or about the simile of the quail at all? Oh, yeah, Robin. Uh, do these relate to the 10 fetters? Um, um, like, of course they do, but I mean, like completely or? Yes. Uh, like in stages or? Oh, not in that way. Only in that, if you were to go back to the section where the Buddha describes the four kinds of people and says, that kind of person I would call fettered. Well, at that point, you could substitute the 10 fetters and say, that person is fettered by those 10 things. The, the Buddha doesn't say that, but when he calls them fettered, that's what we are to understand, that they have sensual desire, they have the desire for all those things that are tethers in that way. Yep. All right. Then that's going to conclude our little simile of the quail sutta. That's it for tonight.